The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, religion, and education. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they have been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Howie Evans, sports editor of New York's Amsterdam News. Hi, Howie. How are you today? Hello, Russ. How are you? Okay. Uh, recently, there was a premiere of a film about black basketball on ESPN, and it was called Black Magic. It was produced by Earl Monroe. How well do you think this film portrayed the role of blacks in basketball? Well, for the time that they had the four hours, the two hours one day, two hours the next day, uh, they did a tremendous job in terms of, uh, of course, you can't rewrite 50 years of history and comprise it into four hours and all. But what, what they did uh, do in bringing that film together was, was, was remarkable. Remarkable in the sense that it was an educational film more than anything, and I'm, and I'm sure that the young people who never saw Earl Monroe play as a youngster and as an mba -er and so forth were probably astounded by his many moves and those of Cleo Hill and so forth. So that in itself was an education. Uh, the other part of it is is that we have a generation, maybe perhaps two or three generations, of, of, of Americans, black and white, young people now who never really saw the race riots of the 50s and the 60s. They never saw their friends, family members perhaps, beating up uh, black youngsters, black students, black citizens across the country. So that in itself was, was the educational part of that. Well, one of the things the film did do was to intercut the development of basketball in the black colleges and the black community with what was happening in civil rights in the black community. And that was uh, very, very important. They used really classic film footage about that. But one of the things that many people don't re remember I'll reflect on it. Bas basketball was invited in 1891 by James Naismith. The black colleges, where practically all the black students went to college in the 19th century and early part of the century, played basketball just like the whites. But because of segregation, they didn't have an opportunity to play against white players, with one or two exceptions. And as a result, the black community knew about them, but the white community didn't. There was no professional basketball league at that particular time. Most of the basketball was amateur and semi-pro and traveling on the road. So this film tried to bridge that gap. Now, one thing I found very interesting, it focused on two major black coaches, John McClendon and uh, uh, Clarence Beekhouse Gaines. Uh, McClendon... Uh, who coached at North Carolina Central College, at that time North Carolina College for Negroes, and then later Tennessee State, and then later was the first black professional coach with the, uh, a predominantly white team, uh, the Cleveland Pipers. He studied with Naismith. He learned basketball from Naismith. So he brought some of those skills into the black colleges, and then many of the uh, other coaches began to pick those up. Uh, I was a, an assistant coach at West Virginia State College in 1946, where Coach Earl Lloyd became the first black to play in the NBA. And we used to play McClendon's teams. We used to play Big House Gaines' teams. And we knew how good we were, but the larger white society didn't. Now, what did this film do, in your opinion, to help bridge that gap? Well... <laughs> You've done a good job of, of, of kind of bridging the gap in, 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 your, in your remarks, but uh, John McLendon and, and Big House Gaines were synonymous with uh, college basketball. Indeed, we referred to uh, Coach Mack as the godfather of, of, of uh, black college basketball, and indeed he was. Uh, you, you noted uh, in, in, in your remarks uh, that Naismith sort of taught uh, Coach Mack, uh, and in in some ways he did because Naismith himself was learning about the game, 
how to coach it, how to teach it, and so forth. And McLendon was a student, and he became fascinated with this game of basketball. So he created things well beyond those that Naismith was doing. I mean, he soared past him uh, in, in terms of his knowledge of the game, his innovations that, that, that became so much a part of basketball. He introduced all of these things first to uh, black colleges. They had never seen this before, and, and the mainstream colleges had never seen this, although they would come and sneak in and watch him practice and watch this when he was at North Carolina uh, College. And uh, so he was the guy who really, more so than anyone, even John Wooden or anyone, created what we know today is fast break basketball, give and go back. He, he, he created all of that. Well, one of the things that's very interesting, you talked about the movement of basketball from a static game where two guys would just throw the ball back and forth and then throw it into the center and the guy make a hook shot to a running game. Now, many of the teams that we played in West Virginia uh, played that way, but McLendon's team would always have to be ready for what we call a track meet because they'd get the ball, throw it down the court, run as fast as they could. He didn't always win. That Part of that was talent. But he played a game, North Carolina played a game that uh, was exciting. People like to watch it. But the thing that really made the difference, which the film does talk about, uh, a black college, uh, Tennessee State, was the first college to win a national championship in the NAI tournament. They did it three years in a row with the uh, Dick Barnett, who later played with the Knicks. That began to get the attention of some of the white population. They'd play in Kansas City. That's where that tournament was. And then uh, a few years later, Winston-Salem, coached by Clarence Big House Gaines, won the NC2A Division II championship, which said that black colleges play good basketball. And then what happened? The, the pros came along. First Earl Lloyd, then Chuck Cooper, and then Sweetwater Clifton, and uh, gradually Will Chamberlain the blacks began to take over in terms of their performance, professional basketball, and then integration came to the colleges around 1970, 1975, and that really changed the nature of black college basketball. Be, the, the best players would usually be recruited by the predominantly the white colleges, and the black colleges had great players, but they weren't as tall in many instances. So that was a transition that comes about. How do you think the American public views that now, now that they've seen this picture. What do you think that'll do to their view of basketball as a game? Well, I, I, I don't think the movie will do that much in terms of their education of the, of the game of basketball as it evolved from the black colleges, from the YMCA's of the early uh, 1900s of the sports clubs around Harlem and Washington DC and Brooklyn I don't think that's going to really uh, I don't think the film really uh, uh, captured mm. that aspect mm. of it. Uh, what it what what the film did capture was the lack of opportunity mm. that was the most important message mm. that that film uh, mm. as, 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 it, as it developed the lack of opportunity which 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 later on in the 60s, late 60s, began presenting itself. Mm -hmm. uh, black college basketball in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, the best athletes, not the best basketball players, but the best athletes in this country were black athletes mm -hmm. in the sport of baseball, basketball, football, and so forth. They were the best athletes in the country. It is one of the major reasons that the white schools did not want them because they were well aware that they, talent-wise, would not be able to compete with, 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 with these kids if they played them as your team and my team. Yes. So thus, it created integration. That was the, that was, that was the, the, the manner in which yeah, they were you, able to do that. As you were talking, I was remembering the days when some of the great players like Jimmy Brown would have to uh, 
stay in a different hotel when the teams went to the South. And they would play, and they liked the way they played, but they were still segregated. So this is really a cross-cut between the racial attitudes and the segregation of the country and athletics, which is supposed to be based on individual talent. And as you say, Dan Cloretz, who actually wrote and produced the film, did a good job of focusing on opportunity, that here were some great athletes, great people, who were denied opportunities. Many of them did get the opportunities. Not many. A few got the opportunities. Many didn't. And he talks particularly about Cleo Hill, who was a great player, but because his performance was somewhat different and he didn't take being pushed off to the side, he was exiled from uh, the league. Not officially, but informally, they wouldn't hire him. That's a question of lack of opportunity. And I think people resonate that to, to, to that today. There are people who have skills, white or black, but generally black, who are denied the opportunity because of some bias. They are too tall, too dark, uh, too inarticulate. Uh, for example, the, the movie talks about Bob Love, who had a stuttering problem, played with the Chicago Bulls. And they talked about how, in a sense, he wasn't projected as a star because he couldn't talk easily. But then it shows how he went and to a place and he got the education, he cured his stuttering problem, and now he's a national speaker. Those are the kind of things that I think that the general public will take from this, because they're so accustomed to seeing great players on television now, they think they just grew up, which they don't. So as you are a sports writer, editor of the Amsterdam News, You've covered black basketball. You covered the CIAA, uh, which is the uh, was the major conference for a African American basketball. It was called at that time the Colored Intercollegiate Athletic Association, and then there was a parallel, the Southwest Athletic Association. Uh, what now do you see happening in those predominantly black uh, conferences? Well, in the, the SWAC, the Southwestern Athletic Conference, and the SIAC, Southern Intercollegiate Athletic Conference, and the Mideastern Athletic Conference, and the CIAA, the thing now is, is, is that the talent pool continues to erode. The talent pool continues to not soar, but de-escalate. Now, when you uh, say the talent pool, you mean the top players or just the general pool of players? Because there are more people no, playing basketball now than no, ever before. No, 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 no. The, 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 if, if we're talking basketball, if we're talking football, which are the money sports uh, on the college campuses? Those money are the, except uh, for the students. The colleges yeah, get the yeah. money, the students well, don't. Well, in terms, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. revenue-wise, those, yeah, those are the sports, and, and in particular, most of the schools, football mm -hmm. uh, carries uh, the athletic department uh, financially. Uh, the, because of the three divisions, Division Three, Division Two, and Division One A or Division One AA, whatever it is, now those conferences, Division Two in particular, in which most of the black schools were in for the last 25 years or so, what happened to further dilute the pool of talent is that many of those Division Two white universities, predominantly white universities, stepped up to Division I. They had far superior, and they have far superior facilities. They are on television and so forth. Now, the first thing these young people ask is, how many games do you play on television? <laughs> if you don't play on television, it's very hard to recruit a youngster out of any school in, in America. Mm -hmm. And of course, the black schools do not have the national television exposure of their counterparts. Mm -hmm. They're getting better. ESPN is doing a, a, a very good job in terms of what of, 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 of programming black schools in, in particular basketball and football and all. But it, 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 it will never equal the exposure that Notre Dame, University mm -hmm. of Michigan, and so forth get. 
and 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 you have to understand that the television networks, when they spent these resources, people traveling to to uh, put these games on technically and so forth, the audience at these games are 100,000 people. I mean, their stadiums are bigger than many of the professional stadiums. This is what uh, an organization like ESPN likes. They turn those cameras on, they see these students, they see 100,000 people in the stands. Now, you go down to say, a school like Coppin State or Maryland Eastern Shore, and so forth, you turn the cameras on, and there's nobody. And maybe three or four you thousand see, people. Thanks. You see, so it, 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 it's not only a cosmetic thing, it's a financial thing because you can't sell advertisers if there's no enthusiasm of, 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 of the participating people in the stands. Mm -hmm. Of course, in many ways, you've given us a brief history of the changes, the climate in sports and colleges from, let's say, the 1920s to the 1950s to the 1970s. Um, television made the difference. Uh, prior to that, newspapers would cover the games and you get some uh, coverage and get some pictures and so on. And uh, a few colleges, mainly in football, some in basketball, would get the publicity. Now with television, on a uh, digital or satellite system, you get 100 stations. So that's, that's a difference. Also, it relates to the role of sports in our society. Sports is entertainment. Uh, even though these games are played at colleges, they're not really educational activities, they're entertainment. And the colleges use them to help promote the college and let people know what's going on in their college. Some of the athletes get an education, most of them don't. Most of the ones on these highly professionalized programs leave college before they even take four years of school. And uh, the NC2A, the National Collegiate Athletics, are trying to push schools to keep students in school. But because of the money that's available to a star leaving to sign a $10 million contract when he's getting $100 a month as an athlete, there's a change. And the public, I think, has accommodated to that. But the question I want to ask you is, what impact do you think this has had on the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, of African Americans who are going to school, uh, playing sports, trying to improve themselves. Does this give them a false hope? No, no, it it it, it doesn't. Because ninety nine percent of the of the African American youngsters going to college are not going to college for sports. Mm -hmm. It's it's only a small small segment mm -hmm. of the population on whatever size that particular college campus is. If they, if they only have 1,200 students, you might only have 25 kids involved in basketball. Mm -hmm. If they have a football team, you might have 75 or 80 kids. So it's a very small segment of the population of those particular campuses that, that, that uh, in this class of, of people not being educated, the majority of these kids going to these schools are, are, are graduating. Yeah, I agree, but what I'm talking about, does it send a false message to parents? Keep your kid playing basketball, never worry about studying because you're going to be a pro. The chances of these 10 or 20,000 kids who graduate a year getting to be a pro, if 100 of them make it, that's a lot. So what I think we need to do is to focus on the role of sports and helping them to get an education rather than sports as an end. Well, maybe maybe I'm a little bit different than a mm -hmm. lot of other people in, in terms of how we view mm -hmm. the, the kids leaving high school, going to college. I think uh, if you spend a year at, on, a, on a college campus, it's an education mm -hmm. because you move into a different environment mm -hmm. and, and, and so forth. Uh, we ask our people and we ask our young people, we ask ourselves to pursue the American dream of making money, getting out and getting a job, being able to support yourself, being able to buy cars and all of this kind of things. Now, the 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 vast majority of these kids who are going into the NBA, number one, they all don't want to think that they're going to play in the NBA or play in the NFL. They might say that as an act of bravado in, in terms of themselves 
and, and all. But most of them are well aware of their skill mm -hmm. level mm -hmm. and, and how they will fit into this overall scheme of making millions of dollars mm -hmm. and all. So there are so many different outlets now for these kids to even play. There's leagues in Europe, there's leagues in, in Europe now and so forth, basketball-wise. So uh, I, 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 tr I truly believe that if a kid spends a year or two years in college, he's going to or she is going to become a better person educationally wise. Uh, agreed, but given that the average pro career is four to ten years, if they don't get that degree, what do they do for the next level? Well, if a guy makes, say, say, uh, say LeBron James decides that well, he, he doesn't, doesn't want to quit, <laughs> you know, uh, if, if uh, most, many of these people now, uh, when I say people, I mean these young people going into the NBA and the NFL and baseball and so forth, they are more in tune to their futures now than people like Reggie Jackson mm -hmm. and all the people uh, who played 25 years mm -hmm. ago. They're more in tune financially into what to do with their money. And they have financial advisors who kind of help them along and, and, and so forth. Now, some of them screw yeah. up their money. Yeah, I agree, know. Howie, but what I'm driving at is you talking about the stars. The no, I'm people, just talking the about people, the people, period. The people hanging on it, average player in the NBA makes about a million dollars. Career is about, no, the average, <laughs> the average 13th and 14th player, the, the ones at the lower end. In the NBA. In the NBA. Oh, no. The, very few of them make less than $3 million. Okay, all right. Well, let's say that. <laughs> yeah. But the fact is that those are the ones, those are the exceptions of the literally hundreds of thousands. The, the point that some of us in education are making is that you can do both. You can get an education and get your sport, but you've got to pay attention to your education. The LeBron Jameses, who are a multi, multi, multi-millionaire, they are very, very few and far between. You don't guide a society toward the exception, you guide it toward the larger population so that you can improve the quality of life in the community. So what I think you folks in the sports business ought to be doing is say, look, and I think you do it, I read your stuff in the afternoon news, stay in school and play your sport. If you leave to go into pros, go back to school. There were several, and you wrote about it last week, about a young man who's going back into school. So one of the messages that we have to uh, send through television, and I think the NCAA tries to do, NCAA tries to do that, the NBA sometimes, stay in school, get an education, help. So uh, what do you think the role of the, the sports columnists, the sports media is in this? Well, I, 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 in general, mm -hmm. I don't think the sports media play, plays any role in uh, encouraging young people to uh, go to school and so forth. I think you've, you may find that more with guys who have gone to school mm -hmm. and come back into their communities mm -hmm. who have not made the NBA or the NFL, who have gone back in their communities. We have an army of people around the city. When I say people, I'm talking about people who have been through college realizing that they're not going to play in the NBA or play in the NFL, who are tremendous role models in their respective communities mm -hmm. in terms of working with kids. Mm -hmm. I've spent my whole life mm -hmm. on the playgrounds of, of mm -hmm. the city uh, working with kids, mm -hmm. and our message is to stay in mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. That is our message because we are well aware that all of you are not going to go into the NBA, and we stress how important it is for you to get an mm -hmm. education. And I would say that most of the kids do. Now, they don't, they, they don't all go to Duke. They don't all go to North Carolina. They don't all go to Georgetown. But they go to school. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. They go to small schools. They go to schools up in New England. I mean, we got an army of, 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 of young people who are on campuses mm -hmm. in New England. Mm -hmm. We have an army of kids mm -hmm. who are in schools on southern campuses, mm -hmm. not, not just the black colleges. Mm -hmm. And these are kids who found out very early mm -hmm. that I'm not going to be the next Earl Monroe. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be the next Gale Sayers or whatever, 
you know, so I better go in and stay in school and so forth. Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned Gail Sayers, and I, I'm sure that most of the people in the audience who are young don't know who Gail Sayers was, one of the greatest running backs in the history of sports, which points up how temporal sports is. Your time periods are really very, very small as an individual, and even in epochs. 25 years ago seems like a long time to a kid who's 23. To somebody like us, it seems like the middle of our lives. For some other people, it seems like it was always that way. So those are the kind of things we do. And particularly, I want to mention groups like the Sports Foundation that was founded by Bob Williams, and you've worked with them, to help young people see the relationship between sports and education. Uh, as a matter of fact, the motto of the Sports Foundation is building social responsibility through sports. And Howie Evans, you've done a great job with that, both in your writing in the Amsterdam News and in your community work, work with so many groups. Today on African American Legends, we've been talking with Howie Evans, the sports editor of the New York Amsterdam News. We've been talking about black basketball. We've been talking about the movie Black Magic. And we're talking about the role of black colleges in helping these young men and now young women to move ahead in their careers and their sports. Thank you again, Howie Evans, for being with us on today's African American Legends.